All right, as we continue our study through the Gospel of Matthew, the scene before us begins with the rich young ruler coming to Jesus with a very important question concerning eternal life. Um, this young man will not like Jesus' answer to his question, but then Jesus will use this scene to teach his disciples about the impossibility of someone trying to make it to heaven based on their own efforts. And then Jesus will tie it all together with the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which goes through the first half of chapter 20, and so it all will tie together. So let's look at this man known as the rich young ruler. Verse 16 of chapter 19 in the Gospel of Matthew. It says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, how do we know this is the rich young ruler? Well, a few verses later, he'll tell us that he is extremely rich and he was young. It's in Mark's gospel that we see that he was um, a very rich man. And when he asked Jesus, um, you know, what good thing do I have to do? You know, Mark will t uh, Mark's gospel will tell us, he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, as you know, there's nothing you can do to inherit anything. You can't work for an inheritance. You don't earn an inheritance. Somebody else has to die. And then you automatically receive an inheritance if you are part of the inheritance. It's an interesting question, though, for a couple of reasons that we'll see here. This question is very um, important, though. What good thing must I do to inherit, to get eternal life? It reminds me of the people who came to Jesus in John 6, 28 and 29. It says, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So again, there's nothing you can do for your salvation. All you can do, all you must do is believe. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, and he will give you eternal life. And so this rich young ruler realizes that there is something missing in his life. And he could not fill this void with his money, his position, his authority, his, you know, being young. He had the whole, his whole life ahead of him, and yet he still had that empty void in his heart. Now, we see people like this all the time in our country and, well, throughout the world. But these big CEO company leaders, you know who they are. You know, they'll build their rocket ships because they have nothing else to do with their billions. And it's amazing that they are so empty. They're looking for something to fulfill a void in their life. But without Jesus, they are spiritually empty. And they will be lost forever unless they turn to Christ. By the way, this rich young ruler, we're told in Mark's gospel, he falls before Jesus, he kneels down before Jesus, and he asks him, good teacher. He's the only guy that we read about that kneels before the Lord and leaves worse off than when he came to Christ. So look at verse 17. So he, Jesus, said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So first of all, he says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. He's the only good one. In other words, he's asking him, do you believe that I am good because I am God? Or are you saying I'm good because I'm just, you know, another religious leader? If he's just another good religious leader, then he's not really good. He'd actually be a liar because Jesus has claimed, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He says, I and the Father are one. He says, before Abraham was, I am. He's taking the eternal name of God. So he's either God or he's a liar or a lunatic. If Jesus was just another religious leader, then his words would carry no more weight than a lot of other religious leaders. But if Jesus is good because he is God, then people need to listen up. They need to pay attention to what he says. Now, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we're told there is nobody good. No, not one. You know, we're told by Paul in Romans 3, 20, uh, 3 12. But look at this verse. It's, Paul gets this from Psalm 14. 
Verse 3, it says, They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. So no one is good except God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is good. Now, notice he also says in the second half of verse 17, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Again, if only God is good and God gave us commandments, then just keep his commandments perfectly. After all, they're not just laws, but they're God's laws. And God keeps his own laws. And so if you want to be perfect, you got to keep God's law 100% of the time. Now, we know that's impossible because James says if you stumble in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So nobody can keep the law 100% of the time. Verse 18, Jesus said to him, which ones? Or he said to Jesus, sorry. He said to Jesus, which ones? Which laws do I need to keep? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in quoting these particular commandments, Jesus is giving him the second tablet of the law of Moses. The first tablet, remember Moses had the two tablets. The first one is all about our relationship with God. The second one is all about our relationship with other people. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery, he says. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. The second tablet, you could sum it up by, um, it's in Jesus quoting from uh, Leviticus 19, verse 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice in verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Now, this guy is very honest. You know, he's asking these questions, not like the Pharisees, because we see the Pharisees will ask Jesus questions to test him, trying to trip him up. This guy's very sincere. He's asking questions because he really wants to know how to get to heaven. Now, he's being very honest here when he says, I've kept all those, the ones Jesus quoted, from my youth. There's probably a reference to when he was 13 years old and he went through bar mitzvah. Because when they would go through bar mitzvah, one of the things they would do is he would say to the Lord, I am no longer under the responsibility of my father, but I'm under your care, Father, God, the Lord. And then the father would say, I'm no longer responsible for my son. He's responsible to you, Lord. And that was part of the bar mitzvah. And so this guy is saying, I've kept all these laws since I was 13. Now, his attitude was sincere. He thinks he has done this. This is exactly the same attitude as the Apostle Paul before Paul got radically saved. Before, Paul thought he was keeping the law blamelessly. In fact, this is what we read from Paul, Philippians 3, starting in verse 4. Paul writes, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. He's talking about before he got saved. Circumcised the eighth day, that's what God required, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. They were one of the two tribes that did not turn their back on the Lord. They stayed true to the Lord, and they became known as the nation of Judah, and eventually they would fall. But I'm of the tribe of Judah, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know, I've been, I'm as Jewish as you can be, he's saying. Concerning the law, a Pharisee, the Pharisees were the one that, you know, they looked at every little jot and tittle of the law and tried to live it out. So that's what Paul is saying. I lived it out concerning zeal persecuting the church. You know, he was going after wayward Jews who were going after this false prophet named Jesus. That's what Paul thought. I'm going to arrest them. I'm going to persecute them. I'm going to make them come back to Judaism. That's what he's referring to, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. In other words, before Paul got saved, he was exactly like this rich young ruler, yet Paul was on steroids you know, when it comes to keeping the law. 
Paul would learn on the road to Damascus that his self-righteous attitude about being self-righteous was nothing but rubbish. Literally, when Paul says, all my righteous deeds are nothing but, uh, I'll say it in our vernacular, a pile of manure. That's what he literally says. It's a pile of dung, all of my righteousness. When Paul came face to face with Jesus, he quickly realized that all of his self-righteousness was worthless in the presence of a holy, righteous one, Jesus Christ. Obviously, Paul's encounter with Jesus was the turning point in his life, and he quickly received Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and his life was radically changed from that day forward, and he stopped putting confidence in his own worthiness, his own flesh. So look at verse 21. Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect... Go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Now, look at what Mark says concerning this scene here in Mark 10, verse 21. It says, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. That's what Jesus tells us, you know, Luke 9, 23. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's the bottom line. you got to follow Jesus. Turn your life over to Christ. So Jesus loved this young man. He had compassion for him. But this is where Jesus holds up the first tablet of the law. Remember the second one, your relationship with others? The first one is all about your relationship with God. The first tablet, what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. That's what he's going to show him here in a moment. You shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. You know, you shall make no carved image um, for yourself and worship and all these different creatures. People would carve an image and bow down and worship it. Don't do any of that. Keep the Sabbath. It's holy to the Lord. So when this young man says, I've kept all those commandments you mentioned, what do I still lack? What do, why am I still empty inside? How does Jesus answer him in this verse? Well, he's showing him the first tablet, so to speak. And the Word of God, the Ten Commandments, are like a mirror. A mirror just reflects who you really are. You look in a mirror, you see your reflection. You hold up the law, God's Ten Commandments, and you realize you're unrighteous. You realize you're a sinner. The law is not to make anybody righteous. The Bible is very clear about that. But the law shows us how unrighteous we are. So what Jesus is showing this rich young ruler is that he's breaking the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And this guy, being rich, his wealth, his possessions... That was his idol. That was his God that he put before the Lord. When it says, no gods before me, that means no other gods alongside of me or with me. And this young ruler who was very rich, he couldn't let go of his money because that was his idol. He had that right alongside of the Lord. This guy's money and wealth meant more to him than his relationship with God. And Jesus easily proved that this was true by telling him, stop trusting in mammon. That was the god of mammon, the god of riches. Don't put your trust in that pagan god. Give it away. Or you might say, lay it down. And when you lay those things down that are a hindrance in your life, God will then step in and he will do a work in your life. But he says, give it away. Come and follow me. I'll give you true riches, true you know, treasures in heaven. You know, this is the perfect illustration of what we saw in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember Matthew 6, starting in verse 19, where Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The problem was not that this young man was rich. The problem was his riches were more important to him than his relationship with the Lord. 
His money was his idol. So look at verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Again, don't think that a person can get saved by doing some kind of good deed. That's not what Jesus is saying here. But the point is, a, a person must be willing to surrender their life over to Jesus. Lay down your worldly gods. Come to Christ. Whatever is a hindrance in your life, you lay it down and you come to Jesus. This rich young ruler goes away sorrowful. Jesus will give anyone who will humble themselves before him the free gift of eternal life. That's just an act of his grace. That's his mercy. That's because he loves us. It's not because of some you know, good deed or some good effort on your part. So he leaves sorrowful. Look at this proverb. Proverbs 11, verse 28. It says, He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. The old saying is true. Riches and wealth can be a great servant, but they can also be a horrendous taskmaster. Who's ruling who? Paul certainly understood this principle. He told the church in Philippi, when he's talking about being content, he says, I've learned to be content when I've had riches. I've learned to be content when I didn't even have two pennies to rub together. He says, what's the key to this? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the context of that verse, is I can be content, no matter if I got a lot or if I got little. I'm content because I have a relationship with Christ. Paul will tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, he talks about the dangers of trying to become rich. He says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Just like this rich young ruler went away from Jesus sorrowful. But take heed to Paul's encouragement. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 to 19, Paul says, Command those who are rich in this present age. And I've said it for years. I mean, that's 99% of everybody in America. Compared to the rest of the world. Mark is over in Eldoret, Kenya right now. There's a lot of poverty over there. Compared to what he's going to see over there, we're rich. So that's Paul's saying here. Command those who are rich in this present age, I would say all of us in here, not to be haughty or puffed up, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And so this rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Or you could say he went away sorrowful because his great possessions had a hold of him. That was the problem. He was a prisoner of his own wealth. And yet Jesus loved him and wanted to set him free. So look at verse 23. So this guy leaves, and Jesus says to his disciples, Surely I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And as we'll see in a moment, this really blows their mind, because in that culture at that time, people truly believed that wealth was the sign that you were being blessed by God. If you were poor, it was a sign that you were not being blessed by God. And the more money you had, the more blessed you were in God's eyes is the way they thought. It was all based on their obedience to God's law. And there's some truth in this because God is very clear. If you obey me, I will bless your flocks. I will bless your crops. If you don't, you're going to be struggling, and he talks about that very clearly in Deuteronomy. But it was all based on how obedient they were to staying true to God's Word. The problem is, they stopped walking by faith and trust in the Lord, and they just started looking to their wealth. And in fact, many of the Jews during this time in Jesus' day, they were ripping off their fellow Jews to become wealthy. And so they looked at their wealth as a sign, hey, we're better than you, even though I just ripped you off. I just broke a bunch of commandments getting your money from you. 
And so they wrongly assume God must love me because I'm rich. God must not love you because you are poor. Again, the word of faith movement today is just exactly that. That's a sign that you're walking with the Lord because you've got health and wealth and you don't need anything. That's what the Laodicean church thought. Remember what Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, because you say, I'm wealthy, I'm in need of nothing. And Jesus says, you don't even realize you're poor, miserable, blind, naked. You know, they didn't even realize the state of their condition spiritually because they were putting their hope in their wealth and not in Jesus. Paul tells us where true riches are found. Ephesians 1, 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And he goes through a lot of those spiritual blessings. We've all been forgiven of our sins. We've been saved by His goodness and grace. We've been sealed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of promise. I mean, we've got so many blessings that are infinitely worth more than anything you could get from Bill Gates or Elon Musk or the rest of those guys. So look at verse 24. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Why are they so astonished? Because they're thinking rich people are the ones God has blessed. And if, they, if it's hard for them to get to heaven, what hope do we have? Because we're not rich at all. These guys say we left everything. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if it's impossible for rich people to be saved, then we're toast. These disciples knew exactly what Jesus was saying in regards to the eye of a needle. Some have tried to say back in that day, there was a little opening in the wall around Jerusalem. And if you took everything off the camel and you got it on its knees, you could kind of maneuver it through, crawl through that little hole. And they, that hole is called the eye of the needle. That's not what he's referring to. Because that's still saying, oh yeah, I can just you know, make it through somehow. Even if I got to crawl a mile upstairs, get all bloody, baby, God will accept. No, that's not what he's talking about. In the Greek, it literally refers to a puncturing tool. The eye of a needle. He's talking about a little hole in a needle, literally. It's easier for a camel to go through that than for a rich man to be saved. He's using an extreme example, again, to show us the impossibility of a person to save themselves. And it doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. Riches can certainly be a hindrance from giving your life to Christ. But so can a lot of things. Pride is certainly a hindrance. A lot of people struggle with pride. They don't want to give up. They got to feel like, I got to earn this somehow. Peer pressure can certainly be a hindrance. After I got saved, all my so called friends in you know, San Diego State, like, they don't want anything to do with me anymore. It was the Christians that did, but the other ones, they're like, nope, nope, because they didn't want to humble themselves before the Lord. They thought, I went off the deep end. We know a lot of misinformation about Jesus that floats around out there. That can be a big hindrance. You know, the biggest hindrance has always been unbelief, lack of faith and trust in Jesus alone for salvation. Well, look at verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said, With men this is impossible. But, here's the good news, with God all things are possible. The disciples asked, who then can be saved? What's his answer? Well, with men, it's impossible. In other words, it is impossible for any person, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they are religious or not, whether they came from a good, upstanding family, or they're from the so-called other side of the tracks. It doesn't matter. You cannot save yourself. Nobody can save themselves. Nobody can earn their way to heaven. Nobody will ever deserve to be saved. So salvation is beyond any of us. And the Bible is crystal clear. There's none righteous. No, not one. We've all sinned, fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. 
So with men, with women, with any human being, it is impossible. And then Jesus says, but with God, all things are possible. In other words, with God, anybody can be saved. With God. Anybody can be completely forgiven of all their sins. Anybody can receive the you know, free gift of eternal life with God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 summarizes it the best. It simply says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So aren't you glad that it was not impossible for God to save you, to love you, to prepare a place in heaven just for you? I mean, this verse would also apply to the things that we face in this world as Christians. You know, with our marriages, with Jesus, it is possible to have a long, wonderful, fulfilling, joyful marriage. Without Jesus, the odds are against you. I'm saying that for me. If I didn't have Jesus... There's no way we'd be together. It wouldn't be Elizabeth. It'd be on me. But with Jesus, He changes us constantly. He renews our heart. He gives us that unconditional love. With Jesus, it's possible. Without Jesus, the odds are certainly against us. With Jesus, it's possible that a nobody like me can stand up here and hopefully feed, tend God's flock Without Jesus, I'd never want to do this. If this was simply a job, this would be one of the worst jobs in the world. I mean, frankly, it is. People pick on you. People say things against you. People do all kinds of things. And it's like, what did I do? I'm just telling you what God says. Don't blame me. Talk to the Lord about it. But with Jesus serving Him in this capacity, it's a privilege. Serving the Lord in anything He's called you to do is a privilege. Now, this is a verse that I'm sure all of you have experienced many times in your own life. Lord, this is impossible. I can't do it. But I know that if you walk with me, if you open doors, if you lead me, I know, Lord, you can get me through, and you can fill in the blank, through this hard time, through this difficult trial, through my broken heart. God can do it. Remember what Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now on the other hand, I quoted it earlier, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So without the Lord, you can't do it. With the Lord, all things are possible. Whatever He calls you to do, He will also equip you to do it. Verse 27, Then Peter answered, and of course it had to be Peter, and he said to him, See, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? So he's basically saying this in response to what Jesus said to the rich young ruler, Go, sell what you have, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, come follow me. So Peter's saying, okay, Jesus, we've left everything behind, we're following you, so what's in it for me? That's what he wants to know. What's our reward? So he says, Jesus kind of humors him here, he said to them, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you, and he's speaking to the twelve, you who have followed me, we know Judas Iscariot did not, you who, have follow, who followed me will also sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Basically, Jesus saying, hey, I got you guys covered. You don't need to worry about it. I mean, this is probably a reference to the millennial reign of Christ when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem, and they'll be ruling and reigning with him, and so all of us will, but they're on 12 thrones. But even as Jesus was about to ascend back into heaven, after spending, you know, he rises from the dead, the next 40 days he appears to them, and he's, the day, the moment he's getting ready to ascend back into heaven, Peter and the rest of the guys still want to know, is it now? Do we get to sit on these thrones now? This is what it tells us, Acts 1, verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, is, it now, is now the time we get to sit on thrones? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons 
which the Father has put in His own authority. Again, it'll happen, but you don't need to worry about it because I've got something special planned for your lives, and it'll be begin on the day of Pentecost. He says, but, verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In other words, the gospel message still needs to go out to a lost and dying world. And it would begin on the day of Pentecost. It would continue until Jesus comes back and we come back with him at his second coming. And then he establishes his kingdom on the earth. He's ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. The Jews that receive Christ, when they see him coming back in the clouds, Paul talks about it in Romans 11, 25, they will see him and they will receive him and all Israel will be saved. In Revelation 1, 7, it says, they will see him coming in the clouds, even those who pierced him speaking of the Jews, and they will receive him. And so they go into the millennial reign of Christ in their natural bodies, and that's when these twelve will rule over them from their thrones. So, verse 29, it says, Everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So here he speaks of, you know, to all of his disciples, including you and me. And the point is, we can never outgive God. God will never be a debtor to anyone. You've left these things. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. Whatever we've given up to follow Jesus, he has blessed us infinitely greater than anything we could ever hope for or imagine. You've left your family to follow Christ, or maybe your family turned their back on you and you got saved. He says, you know what? I've got millions of brothers and sisters for you all over the world. And we do. Wherever you go, you'll find brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, follow me, and you'll be blessed. You've lost your home. I'll give you millions of homes that you'll be welcome in, that you can have fellowship with people. And above all, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, a mansion. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. The greatest thing that you have ever received is eternal life with Jesus in glory. Most of my family members and friends, they thought I was crazy when Jesus saved me. But I've gained infinitely greater in every way once I got saved. I've never given up anything, really. In fact, when I hear people say, look what I've given up to follow Jesus. And I'm thinking, oh, really, you gave up loneliness? You gave up despair? You, you gave up hopelessness and emptiness? You gave up an eternal destination in the lake of fire? <laughs> Wow, what a sacrifice. <laughs> and in return, you've received everlasting life and fellowship with the Creator of the heavens and the earth. All your sins are washed away. And we haven't given up anything in reality to following Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the one who gave up everything to come from His glory in heaven, to come here, born in a stinky barn, takes on human flesh, but he did it because he loved us. He would be nailed to a cross after being whipped and beaten mercilessly. He would shed his blood. He would die a brutal death. But again, it was all because he loved us enough to die in our place, take upon himself the punishment that we deserve for our sins. Listen, we get eternal life instead of eternal damnation. We'll receive new glorified resurrection bodies someday. And we won't have to carry this old carcass around much longer. We'll never experience pain or suffering or death. And we'll get to dwell with Jesus forever and ever. So anyway you slice it, we definitely end up on the better end of this amazing deal. 
So as we begin chapter 20 here, the first half of chapter 20 explains what he just told us in verse 30, when he says, But many who are first will be last, and the last first. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his field. Again, a parable. A parable is an earthly picture cast alongside a spiritual truth and so when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, he's going to use this earthly illustration of this vine, vineyard owner, and he's going to bring people in, these laborers, to work in his vineyard. And this was something all the disciples knew a lot about. They understood this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Now, as I've said before, with parables, you don't build doctrines on parables. It's like this, but it's not exactly this. The point of this parable is, whatever God does, it's right. Whatever He does is just. It's fair. Even though we might not see it being fair, Lord, it's not fair. Why did you bless this guy? And Why did I not get blessed the same way? You know, we think it's not always fair. No, this shows us God is fair. He is just. He is right. This is also about serving Jesus because He has given us eternal life. Serving Him with a grateful heart. So again, this landowner, he goes out in the morning early to hire laborers for the vineyard, verse 2. And when he had agreed with the laborers, the laborers say, well, we'll do this. But you have to agree to our terms. So he agreed with them for their terms. For a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. In this situation, a, um, a denarius is a full day's wage. That's what it equals. You work a denarius, you get a full day's wage. So what is it today? I don't know, 100 bucks for just going out and laboring, $100. I don't know, whatever it is, it's a full day's wage. This is still a common practice today. You see it in a lot of different places where the owner of something looking for laborers, he'll go, and I use it at the marketplace, maybe around Home Depot. I, you see this in San Diego a lot. People will go and they'll hang out there and they're just waiting for somebody to hire them. And they're just looking to get hired for the day. They don't care what it is, but they're willing to work. So that's what these guys are doing. Look at verse 3. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. So now it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And they're hanging out. They're also waiting to be hired. By the way, uh, a full day's wage was 6 in the morning till 6 at night. They didn't have unions back then. So they worked an honest day's wage, 6 in the morning, 6 at night. These guys are hired at 9 in the morning. They will work to 6. But notice, the owner says, I'll pay you whatever is right. They're harvesting grapes. You know, harvesting grapes, there's a small window. You can't pick them too early. You can't wait too late. So you got to make sure you get enough people to harvest during that time frame. Verse 5. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. So now he's saying noon. He goes out and hires people to work from noon to six. And then he goes out at three in the afternoon till six. So this guy really wants to get his grapes harvested before time is up. Verse 6. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So this is getting ridiculous now because it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He hires them for one hour of work. He says, why are you just standing here? Well, nobody hired us. I think this landowner is really concerned about the laborers more than he is the labor. But be that as it may, remember the guys who worked all day, they insisted on having a contract to work for a denarius for a 12-hour job. Everyone else trusted the landowner to do what's right and fair. So, verse 8. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. 
It goes back to Peter saying, we left everything to follow you. What is our reward? Well, the first or last, the last or first. Look at verse 9. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they received a denarius. They get 100 bucks for their one hour of labor. They're probably thinking, wow, this landowner is amazing. How good is he to bless us? With a full day's wage, we're only working for an hour. Look at verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. They're thinking, we worked 12 hours. I'm sure we're going to get 10 or 12 times as much as the guy that worked one hour. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, verse 11, they complained against the landowner saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day? So now we're getting to the heart of the parable here. It's their heart, their attitude, their motives for serving the owner wasn't right. Now, if you and I only serve the Lord because of what we want to get out of it, we want the benefits, we want the rewards, we want the blessings whether they're now or eternal blessings, we miss out on the best part of why He has called us. He wants us to walk with Him. He wants us to enjoy fellowship with Him. He wants us to see Him working in us and working through us. He just wants us to trust Him completely, believe that He will always do what is right and fair, what is best for us, this can be a problem with so-called professional ministers. We, I'll put myself in this category, can wrongly think, you know, we're going to get rewarded more. Look at all I'm doing for you, God. And look at this guy over here. He's just going to get in by the skin of his teeth. That's a wrong attitude. I don't know about you. I'm just glad that Jesus saved me at the 11th hour. I feel like one of these 11th hour guys. I haven't done nothing. You look at Paul, you look at Peter, you look at all these guys after Pentecost, and I mean, it's amazing what God did through them, the things they went through. It was uh, amazing. I'm just glad that He saved me by His goodness and grace. None of us, we don't have any room to boast. We, we don't have any room to complain about the way God is using us, the way God will use us for His plans, for His purposes. Think about the thief on the cross. I would put him in the category that he was an 11th hour, 59 minute, 59 second guy. <laughs> Out of a 12 day, hour day, he was like right at the brink of the clock saying, done, too late. Look at this in Luke 23, starting in verse 42. This is the thief on the cross. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amazing. He was two thieves on the cross hanging next to Jesus. He's in the middle. You got one thief here, another thief there. Initially, they're both mocking Jesus. They're both getting on his case. Yeah, you're the son of God. Why don't you get us down from here? Save yourself and us. And then it says at some point in time, while he's hanging there, He's listening to Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, he, he just talks about different things with the people below. John, this is your mother. Speaking of Mary, you take care of my mom. Mom, this is your son, John. I mean, and they're just seeing something in Jesus. This one thief, and he's broken. He knows my time is up. So he says, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, today you'll be with me in paradise. I would have to say that guy got a full reward. If he ever thought, my life was for nothing, I wasted my whole life being a thief, God could tell him, wait a minute, you know how many millions of people got saved because of you? Not because of him, but your example, hanging on the cross, dying, talk about Beth, you know, deathbed confessions. 
That's what this thief was doing. How many millions of people have gotten saved because at the end of their life, I'm dying of cancer. I'm dying of this. I, I'm, I'm bleeding out or whatever. Lord, help me. Save me. And the Lord is faithful. They just humble themselves and cry out to Jesus. None of us will ever know the impact we've had on others until we stand before Christ and hopefully we'll hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Finally, look at verses 13 to 16. But he answered one of them, these guys are complaining, and said, friend. Isn't that great? Aaron mentioned that during worship. He calls us friend. Even when we grumble and complain, he calls us friend. I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. And that's the bottom line here. The owner of the vineyard, in this case God, he is both good and he is both generous. And none of us as his children should sit here and complain about what he's doing, what we think he should be doing. God, you should be doing Look at the world. Look at the mess in Ukraine. God knows. We sit here and complain about so many things. God wants us to serve him with a grateful, thankful heart. Always remember, Jesus is the head of the body. Go through 1 Corinthians and... You know, the carnal group that's going through 1 Corinthians Tuesday night. I'm just kidding. That's what John's going through 1 Corinthians, right? Okay, anyway. So you get to 1 Corinthians 12 and it talks, Jesus is the head of the body. We're just the body parts. He's the head. And Paul talks about, you know, the hand doesn't say to the foot, I have no need of you. Well, I'm better and more important than you. He says, no, the hidden parts, the kidneys, liver, those are hidden. Those are more necessary, Paul says. And yet they're, they're unseen. They're behind the scenes. You know, it's like that, you know, you talk about the, that one person. They're very quiet. All they do is pray for missionaries. You think their reward is going to be less than somebody else? I don't think so. Maybe even greater. You know, we're all part of the body. And we all need to work not in competition with one another, but we should be working complementary with one another, working together for His glory. Well, <laughs> 